happy, happy? Happy, happy, yeah. what does that mean? Like if she wants to know if I'm pleased with something, she'll say, happy, happy? Oh, you're happy. I'm happy. Oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's not so bad. Oh, come on. What, are you kidding? So tell her not to say it. I'm much more comfortable criticizing people behind their backs. <laughs> anyway, look who's talking. You just broke up with Melanie last week because she shushed you while you were watching TV. Hey, I got a real thing about shushing. <laughs> what is this? Did you ever get the feeling like you had a haircut, but you didn't have one? I'm all itchy back here. What? What is this? What, what are we doing? What in God's name are we doing? What? Our lives. What, what kind of lives are these? We're like children. We're not men. No, we're not. We're not men. We come up with all these stupid little reasons to break up with these women. I know. I know. That's what I do. That's what I do. Are we going to be sitting here when we're 60 like two idiots? We should be having dinner with our sons when we're 60. We're pathetic, you oh. know that? Yeah, like I don't know that I'm pathetic. <laughs> Why can't I be normal? Yes, me too. I want to be normal. Normal. It would be nice to care about someone. Yes, yes, care. Well, this is it. I'm really going to do something about my life, you know? You know, I didn't want to call Melanie again. So what if she shushed me? George, I am really going to make some changes. Yes. Changes. I'm serious about it. You think I'm not? I'm not kidding. Me too. I had a very interesting lunch with George Costanza today. Really? We were talking about our lives, uh -huh. and we both kind of realized we're kids. We're not men. So then you asked yourselves, isn't there something more to life? Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, well, let me clue you in on something. There isn't. <laughs> There is absolutely not. I mean, what are you thinking about, Jerry? Marriage? Family? Well, they're yeah. prisons. <laughs> Man-made prisons. You're doing time. You get up in the morning, she's there. You go to sleep at night, she's there. It's like you got to ask permission to, to, to use the bathroom. Is it all right if I use the bathroom? <laughs> really? Yeah, and you can forget about watching TV while you're eating. I can? Oh, yeah! <laughs> you know what? Because it's dinner time. And you know what you do at dinner? What? You talk about your day. <laughs> How was your day today? Did you have a good day today or a bad day today? Well, what kind of day was it? Well, I don't know. How about you? How was your day? <laughs> Boy, it's sad, Jerry. It's a sad state of affairs. I'm glad we had this talk. Oh, about. you have no idea. <laughs> Good morning, Hope. Uh, welcome to all of you who are tuning in online or at one of our other campuses or local sites, and welcome. Man, it's good to see so many people here in our worship center again. I mean, it's good to see COVID numbers starting to decline. Uh, good to see that um, normalcy starting to sort of creep its way back. It's, it's showing signs anyway. We're not there. I get it. We're not there. Um, so if you're online, which is where most of you are, just remember, camera adds 10 pounds, and we will welcome you back when you're ready to come. And if you are going to everything else, indoors, and doing public things, but not coming to church, you need to get to church, is what you need to do. But if you have good reasons to stay home and do online, then do that. So Kramer um, kind of represents the world's view on marriage, and Jerry and George are about to have a breakthrough. The irony is Kramer's never been married, at least as far as I know. We don't even know his first name till like season three. And he gets into all sorts of other messes along the way. So why would you take advice from this guy who says that marriage is a prison, it's man-made prison, you're doing time, and a whole bunch of other things, and you sit down for dinner and you talk about your day, how was your day, I don't know, how was your day, and on and on it goes. It just sounds so mundane and horrible and awful. Reminds me of on my wedding day, December 19th, 1987. Just as I'm about to walk out from the sacristy uh, in one corner of the church to meet my bride who's going to walk down the aisle. Uh, this was my third marriage, but Sally was later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was the one and only, my one and only for sure. So I was about to re meet my bride and uh, Sally was going to walk down the aisle and I was going to meet her and it was so exciting. And one of my groomsmen leaned over to me and said, well, Mike, it's all downhill from here. 
<laughs> and I think that kind of represents the worldview. Uh, a little bit like Kramer in the Seinfeld clip, that this groomsman of mine was speaking from that perspective of the world that says that it goes like this. If you are lucky, you meet somebody, maybe you fall in love, and if you fall in love enough, you get to the point where you take the leap of faith and you get married. And then it's all downhill. So everything until then was sort of the uphill climb. Everything until then was this kind of ascension, you know, up the mountain. And it just keeps getting a little better and a little better and a little better. And it finally is so good. You said, we're going to make this commitment. We're going to get married. And then you're married. And then you're stuck. The world says. Then you've got the ball and chain or the old man or, or whatever it might be. And you're, you're stuck with it. You got what you got. I'm here to tell you today some really good news, and this isn't just for married people, because marriage affects us all. Marriage is, is a foundation of our culture, of our society. It's essential. It's, it's good for so many things that the more you think about it, the more you realize. It's good for the economy. It's good for security for kids. It's good for uh, the way kids grow up and develop. It's good for love. It's good for connections. It's good for all sorts of things. You, the Bible's very clear on this. Jesus wasn't married. The Apostle Paul wasn't married. All sorts of other heroes in the Bible weren't married. You don't have to be married to be fulfilled. You don't have to be married to be satisfied. You, you can be single. Paul even says, I wish you had the gift I had where I'm single and that's what God's given me and I'm blessed with that because God's got a calling on my life that I fulfill and, and so marriage isn't a part of that plan. But marriage is a big deal in, in God's creation. And we read about it right from the beginning of God's creation, and then Jesus picks up on that. In contrast to Kramer, Jesus says, this is what marriage is. Two people, two individuals are united into one. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's the ideal. It's spiritual. It's uh, intimacy on every level, emotional, uh, relational, uh, physical, sexual, and because the Bible talks about these things, we are going to talk about these things. Even though it's not always that com that all that comfortable for you to hear sermons on marriage and sex, I can assure you it's not comfortable for preachers to preach on this topic. But I don't want you to have like a seven-eighths faith. I, I don't want you to have the kind of faith that's incomplete. I don't want you to have the kind of walk with Jesus where... You know, Jesus is just about a few things, but isn't about all these other things that we think about or, 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 or trip over or it, it, it causes issues in, in our lives or the lives of others. Because Jesus has some really important things to say about marriage and about sex and, and about sexual boundaries. And I think that this is important that we know what Jesus says. Because there's a lot of people making it up. There's a lot of people even wanting Jesus to say things he didn't say. There's a lot of people who say, well, we'll just take the popular opinion of the world's advice, or we'll take uncle's advice, or cousin's advice, or sister or brother's advice, or a friend's advice, or my, my social group of friends. I'll just adopt what they say marriage is. But Jesus says it's holy, and that God is the one who does it. God joins two people together. It isn't just two people making a decision to get married. When it's right, it's God bringing two people together as a part of God's plan for our lives. And God doesn't want anyone to split that up. Because the union is holy. It's a bond. And it's not to be separated. So this is all part of our sermon series we're in right now called Say What? Where we're looking and making sense out of some of Jesus' more shocking statements. You said, well, that's not really that shocking that Jesus wants people to have a high view of marriage. That God invents marriage, so of course Jesus comes along and says, this is important, you shouldn't just minimize this or act like it's a big nothing. It's a big something. But Jesus goes on to say some other things that are in complete contrast with the world's view. Let's take a closer look at the world's view. Doing marriage and sex the world's way. And I will ask the question that I'm fond of asking on all sorts of subjects when I preach over the last quarter of a century, which is, how's that going for you when you go the world's way? How's marriage and, and sexuality and your views on those things, how's that working out for you by just adopting what the world says about these things? What we have is 40, 40 to 50%, depending on what survey you want to believe, of marriages ending in divorce. 30 to 40% of marriages 
have to deal with adultery. It becomes a part of what a marriage is for 30 to 40 percent of married couples. Um, a, a sweeping away or a denial of, of what seems to be really prudish and restrictive boundaries, especially when it comes to things like premarital sex. People say, oh, come on. I still remember when I was a 26-year-old pastor right out of seminary, and I was at Palestine Lutheran Church in Huxley, Iowa. I was teaching the confirmation students, the eighth grade confirmation students on the Ten Commandments. And we got to the adultery commandment and started talking about what the Bible says about sex and, and where those boundaries are. And I talked about premarital sex and how God wants people to wait. <laughs> this one eighth grade girl looked at me and she goes, you're kidding, right? I mean, you're absolutely joking, right? I mean, you, you've got to be kidding. I'm like, no, I'm not. And here's, here's why. Premarital sex leads to lower quality of sex after marriage. Did you know that? Just going to go ahead and throw that out there. Now, please, let me, let, let me be clear on this. 97% of couples who get married do not wait anymore. Or maybe they never did. But 97% don't wait. And so if you're in a marriage like that and you're sitting there you're like, wow, thank you very much for the sermon with a full serving of shame and guilt. And I will just take that home with me and think that I'm not really a good enough Christian and I don't really belong with Jesus. And golly, that's just great. I'm sure glad I came to church today. <laughs> Let me be really clear on this. God loves you. We love you. We love the 97% of you, right? We, we, we get that. You're, you're in the overwhelming majority. I'm just saying if you're still at a point in your life where you're making a decision on this, the statistics don't lie. It would be better for your sex life. And by the way, the people who are having the most sex and the people who are having the best sex are not single people. Not according to the research. They're married people. They're people who are in a committed monogamous relationship with one other person. The best sex. <laughs> Got to move on because I'm going to blush pretty soon. The, <laughs> the most sex. And can I please just go to the next point, which is easy. We'll just talk about transgenderism. That should be easy. We'll just jump right in. 43% of, here, this is sobering. 43% of transgender youth are bullied on school property. And if that isn't bad enough, LGBTQ plus youth, of which transgender is one of the letters, are three to four times more likely to attempt suicide than peers. Let me ask you something, Christian. Are you okay with that? Because Christians over the last few generations have been a part of the problem. Because the message that folks hear when, they're one, when they identify with one of these letters or any of the plus letters that go beyond it is, God doesn't love me. God hates me. I've sat down in groups that we have that meet here at Hope with people who identify with one of those letters or one of the plus letters, and they all, every single one of them, without exception, has stories, personal stories, direct hits that they've had to receive where people tell them, you're going to hell. You do not belong in God's church. You're not good enough to hang out with us is the message that's either direct or indirect, implied or explicit. You don't belong here. Let me be very clear on this, and this is not preacher's opinion. If you have a problem with what I'm about to say, you're going to have to take it up with Jesus, who shows us over and over again, which I will show you in just a few minutes, that everybody is welcome, and that we are called first, first, first and foremost, to love everyone always, to make sure that everybody, and that means gay or straight, transgender or cisgender, is welcome in this church and should be welcome in every Christian church in the world, if we're going to be Christian. Without exception. And I think we have some confessing to do as Christians on this. You say, oh, well, so that's just, you know, you say something that, that the, the way of the world is going to be, it's going to be popular, it's going to fit the pole. Well, what about the things Jesus said about boundaries? Yep, they're there too. But we have to get to the heart of that matter and not just focus on behavior. Here's the thing that is, most certainly true. It's almost impossible for love and judgment to reside in your heart at the same time. So Christian, which one is more important? Which one does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? 
Which one does Jesus say that is the most important thing that we can do as his followers? If you want to be the most faithful followers, the ones who take the Bible the most seriously, then the Bible seriously says that love for others, even those that we have a hard time loving, is the most important commandment. It's almost impossible to have love and judgment in your heart for another human being at the same time. So which one wins out? The temptation is to judge. The temptation, because of, sometimes because of our own insecurities, sometimes because of our own fears, whatever it might be, to say, well, if I can judge those folks, then I'm going to feel a little safer, whoever those folks are for you. And it's not just the letters here. It's, it's not just uh, people who identify as one way or another. It's straight people. It, it's people who, it, it's the prejudice and the temptation to hate, it's rather broad. But we have bigger, we have, we have other big issues too that doing marriage and sex the world's way trip us up on. There are sadly so few healthy examples of life-giving masculinity and femininity for us to um, follow these days. It's really hard um, in this world for young men and teenage boys to try to figure out what it means to be masculine because they have this in their makeup. Biologically, it's a part of who they are. It's how they're wired up. But we have, they have been told over and over again, this whole mach, macho guy thing it isn't going to work. And so then they wonder, so, well, what, what does? What am I supposed to be? And, and, and then they don't know wh where they're supposed to land. This is, a, this is a serious problem in our world. Being a young adult male is very complicated. And I'll get to females in a moment. It's not easy there either. But there's a, there's a trend that's happening that is alarming that there are a lot of young adults uh, who are men who are in their 20s who are addicted to pornography, addicted to video games, and smoke a lot of pot. They smoke the pot because they want to check out. Be, because they can't figure out who they're supposed to be is, is one of the deeper subconscious reasons if we're going to really look at it seriously. And they're doing everything else digitally and visually because they can't figure out who they be. We don't have these life-giving, healthy examples of masculinity. And this is a major issue. It hurts. It stunts emotional growth. It keeps people from making commitments, young adults. It pushes back the age people get married. It provides all sorts of other issues, economically, sociologically. There's all sorts of stuff there. Don't have time in one sermon to dive deep into that, but it's an issue. Femininity, same kind of problem, over on the other side of the same coin. It's very difficult. Y young women are, are, are taught over and over again, sent, sent so many messages, that the way you make it, the way you find happiness when it comes to sexuality in this world, is, is you, um, you, you have to keep up. And so you, all sorts of eating disorders start creeping up in, in order to try to look like models who are airbrushed and aren't really real anyway. And, and so we play this game. Wow, what a mess. How's that going for us? I think about this. Uh, I've got a daughter. I've got a wife. I, I've got a mother. I, I've got a granddaughter who we just saw again for the first time in a few months this last week. And I look at her, and, you know, she's nine months old, eight months old, and I, eight, nine, eight and a half, nine. She, she's coming up on a year now. And I look at her, and I hold her, and I talk to her, and she and I are bonding, you know, grandfather, granddaughter, and it's heaven on earth. I mean, it's just a glimpse of heaven. It's just the love that pours out of your heart as a grandpa, I, I just don't understand. My ongoing joke is the reason grandkids and grandparents get along so good is we have a common enemy, and, and we, we, we have that bond, right? But I look at my granddaughter, and I think, wow, what you're growing into. This world, what's it going to be like for you as a girl who, I mean, with a grandfather who's as wildly attractive as me, she's likely to be very good looking. <laughs> she will be, I'm not. But it, what, what, what's that going to do for her? And even if she wasn't, what, what's that going to be like for her? The pressures, the stresses. For those of you who are kids, for those of you who are teens, for those of you who are in your 20s, man, it's hard to navigate. It's hard, it's hard to know which way you're supposed to go. We need to do better on that. 
Another one of the outcomes is one out of five women in the United States will be sexually assaulted by age 25. Are you okay with that, Christian? I'm not. What kind of a world is this where my granddaughter has a 20% chance of being sexually assaulted before she's 25? What if it gets worse? And why is that happening? Why are there so many people who think it's okay to do that? To treat her like an object? of sexual desire, first and foremost, before they look at her heart, before they look at her as a human being. How is that okay? We have to do better. Maybe we're following the wrong leaders. Maybe it's time to tune down the Kramer view of what marriage and sex is all about and tune up the the volume, turn it up on the God who invented sex, who is pro-sex, who isn't prudish at all. Have you read Song of Songs in the Old Testament? Holy macaroni. And every once in a while when you read some of the Proverbs, you're like, are you serious that's in the Bible? (laughs) Some of you are not Bible readers at all. be like, I'm reading Song of Songs later today. I'm going to check that out. As you're reading it and you read some of the metaphorical language and you wonder, is that about sex? The answer is yes, absolutely, 100% it is. God's for it. He invented it. But he puts boundaries around it. It's not an anything goes kind of gift. It's a potent gift. It's, an incred- it's a mysterious gift. It's a glorious gift. It's an awesome gift. And it's to be experienced inside of the boundaries that the inventor of the gift says, here's, here's how you're going to get the most out of it. Here's how you're going to enjoy it the most. Here's how it's going to become the best. You're going to have to tune down the world. You're going to have to put down the volume on on the voices that tell you it's this or it's that and it doesn't matter and as long as there are consenting adults involved, who cares, it's all good, it's just sex, the world says. Yeah, I suppose if that's all it is for you. But then what are you missing? What are you missing out from the one who made it to be more than that? We have to talk about this even though it's not comfortable. Because this isn't just people outside the church, this is people inside the church. Pornography's a problem. Pornographic websites are so easily accessible. They receive more traffic in our country than Twitter, Instagram, Netflix, Pinterest, and LinkedIn combined. Wow. You say, oh, it's victimless. It's just, you know, just... I just have these, you know, needs. I have this drive. It's how I am. And we justify it. And we say it's okay. Here's here's the problem with being chained to pornography. It's addictive. It objectifies women and sometimes men. It's a visual drug that can actually, physically, research has shown, rewire your brain so that you start to see people differently. You start to see them first and foremost as objects of sexual desire and secondarily as sisters and brothers in Christ, as as people who have a heart. It rewires how we think about other human beings and it can escalate to extreme and violent behavior. Pornography leads to higher levels of depression. Who doesn't want more of these things? Higher levels of depression, anxiety, loneliness, infidelity, and divorce. Gosh, sign us up. If it was something else, and you're like, here's what you're going to get from doing this, would you sign up for this? It also delays intimacy for young adults, which I already addressed. Pornography is a lie. It's fantasy land. It's the opposite of reality. It creates an unreachable kind of ideal, and so it harms people's sex lives because it isn't real. The list could go on and on and on, but I need to move on. So finally, as pornography use increases, this might surprise you, sexual satisfaction decreases. Why would we want that? But we do. And it's got its hooks into so many Americans. So many of us. And we're like, well, here's the outcome. So yeah, but still, nobody really gets hurt. And, and, And I'm really careful how I do that. Actually, every time you click, you are, you, are, you are becoming a part of a statistic that those pornographic websites use to, to make more money so that they can objectify more women and, and in some cases, in the darkest of cases, get involved in sexual and human trafficking, a, a thing that as a church we are striving and, and seeking to up our game even more. Wait until we get to the month of January. We've got a whole emphasis with one of our mission partners on this. We're not okay with this. I hope you're not either. 
So into this kind of world where lust gets its hooks into us and produces all sorts of, of uh, results that are not productive or helpful or even lead to more pleasure or a happier life. Jesus comes and he says these things, radical things. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those ogling looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt you. They bring darkness into your heart and soul and into your mind. They rewire your brain. Next verse, Jesus goes on to say, you have to blind your right eye then the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else be dumped on a moral trash pile. You say, oh, come on, that, that must be an English translation of the original Greek that's just a little over the top. Actually, it's a translation by one of the foremost Greek, uh, biblical Greek scholars of the last century, Dr. Eugene Peterson. He has a translation called The Message, which is my second favorite translation. And, and so there it is. But if you want to know actually what the literal Greek says, translated in kind of a clunky way from that biblical Greek, the original text of Matthew 5, 29, into English that isn't going to phrase or flow perfectly smoothly, but you'll get the gist it's even more harsh if now your eye causes you literal Greek if now your eye causes you to stumble pluck it out and cast it from you it is better indeed for one of your limbs to die and not all your body cast into hell I gotta sit down of all the things that I'm gonna preach about during this series called say what making sense of Jesus most shocking statements it doesn't get more shocking than that and I also I'm gonna stand up now and also, I want to say this to those of you who say, I take the Bible literally. No, you don't. Or you'd have two patches on your eyes right now. <laughs> and if you read the next verse, you'd have your hands cut off as well. We do not take the Bible literally, nor should we take it literally. Go back to um, this verse right here, because we take the Bible seriously. Jesus uses hyperbole. It's very, in some places, it's very clear in the original Greek here. He doesn't want anybody to go out and gouge out their eye physically. He's using hyperbole to make a very important point. And that very important point is, it matters. It matters what your eyes see. It matters what you allow them to look at. It matters what happens between your eyes and your heart, too. Jesus knows you're going to be attracted to other human beings. Jesus knows you're going to be like, wow, that person is wildly attractive. That, that's what it is. Lust is taking that attraction and turning it into something that you just have to have. That you will not be denied of. If your eye causes you to stumble, Jesus says using hyperbole, pluck it out and cast it from you. In other words, stop looking. Stop doing that. These are Jesus' shocking statements. And so he says, say what? Go ahead and go to that screen if you would now, Mary. And to sum up what Jesus says, it would be this. Here's maybe one of the more shocking things about what Jesus says as it's recorded in the Gospels about sex and marriage. The shocking thing that maybe will surprise you is not very much. He doesn't say very much. Which underscores the point that this is not the most important thing for us as Christians. Even though there are Christians and churches who make it sound like sex is the most important issue in the world today. It never has been, and it never will be. It matters. It's important. It's a big part of who we are, but it's not the most important thing. And so really, there's just two places where Jesus directly talks about sex and marriage. And to sum it up, we've already hit on these. Jesus says, marriage is meant to last. Divorce should be rare. Adultery is sin, and lust is adultery. He also says in Matthew 19 that marriage is established by God from the beginning as a holy union and that God brings two people together as one flesh and God made us male and female. Jesus quotes the creation account from Genesis for this reason. This is why God made us this way, different, so that we would have this attraction one to another. If you have an issue with what I'm saying, your issue is not really with me or where our church stands it's with what Jesus says or maybe what you wish he didn't say. But this is what Jesus says instead of the world says. This is why God made us male and female. 
It was for the sake of marriage, but not just procreation, but fulfillment, emotional film, fulfillment, bonds, uh, the enjoyment, the, the ecstasy of, of being able to share this gift, this incredible gift that God has invented inside the boundaries that God has provided for us. That's what our Lord says about marriage. People will say, yeah, but what's really wrong with adultery? I mean, I read Bridges of Madison County and I watched the movie. It seems like it was a good thing for Francesca. Is that her name? She and Clint Eastwood got together on the bridge and it's just the most romantic story because she was unfulfilled in her marriage and, and, and he was a National Geographic photographer and, and so they hung out and they, they, they had this spark and so, you know, it's just nature takes its course. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with adultery is it destroys marriages. There's a reason Bridges of Madison County is fiction because it's not realistic. I can tell you that that's not the way it goes as a pastor of almost three decades now in this community. That when couples come to me, I have yet to meet one couple who says, man, that adultery decision I made, that was excellent. <laughs> that was just a real, I'm so glad I did that. In retrospect, hindsight being 2020, <laughs> yep, that's what, it, just like Francesca and Bridges of Madison, that's what I needed. That's what I got and a happily ever after for me. Man, that, is, that was just awesome. You know what you get? Train wrecks in real life. Absolute train wrecks. People who are crushed. People who feel inadequate. Pe people who feel lost. People who thought, my goodness, this foundation I had in my life suddenly is completely gone. I don't know what to stand on anymore. What do I have left? What, what do we have? What, what am I supposed to do now? How, how, how can I deal with the hurt and the pain and the sorrow and the frustration and the disappointment? That's reality of adultery. It's a home wrecker. It destroys marriages. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing your stories. So I have something to say to you about this. If this is you, and I know, this ha in, a, in a church this big, with all of the people in this room and in our overflow rooms or our, our mast rooms and all of our different campuses in Ankeny and Grimes and Waukee and Ames and Hope Elam and all of our local sites and everybody watching online, which is a ridiculous, tens of thousands of people right now are listening to me. Freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> but I want to say this to you. If you're in an affair right now, the first thing I want you to hear is God loves you. You're like, come on, preacher, get to the point. Let him have it. I am. Only God's love has the power to turn you around. God loves you. And God cares more about you than he does about your behavior. The second thing I want to say is God is not giving your behavior a pass. Stop it. End the affair today. Make the call after church and say we're done. And take that person's name out of your contact list. Block the calls and the texts. It's over. It's done. Because this is where you're headed. The, while it might seem like, oh, this is going to be, this is just such a good, but it, you know, I'm, I just feel so good when I'm with this person. This person makes me feel so alive. Doesn't God want me to feel alive? Doesn't God want me to be happy? Maybe I should be with this person instead of my spouse. Hey, maybe I should think about that. Maybe, maybe divorce because I'm a little tired of this marriage and I want to move into this one now. Stop. Take a closer look. Stop listening to your friends who mean well. They mean well. But they didn't invent marriage. They didn't invent sex. They don't know what the God who made you knows. God's word on this is very clear. Stop. God loves you. We love you. Just from now on when you come to church, sit in the center section. Uh, which, no, I'm just kidding. Which is every section of this church and this platform up here where I preach is the center section too. But stop it. We love you, God loves you, but it's time to stop. It's selfish. It's expensive. It's stressful. It produces anxiety. It damages trust. It leads to more lies. You can't hide your lying eyes when you keep heading to the cheating side of town. It hurts relationships with your spouse. It's not just your spouse though. It's your relationship with God. It never ceases to amaze me that people who are having affairs stop coming to church for a while because they don't want to hear it. 
They don't want to be challenged. They're worried that, well, maybe they'll hear something and be like, I shouldn't be doing this. They don't want to hear the pushback from God. It's going to hurt your relationship with your kids, your relatives, community. On and on it goes. I mean, the list is deep. When affairs lead to divorce, divorce hurts the economy. You can look this up. It's not just the obvious stuff, the relational, sociological stuff. It's the economic stuff, too, if you're into that. There's no good side of adultery. It's a lie, number six. It's the opposite of reality. What I mean by that is the person you're having an affair with, you don't have to decide who's going to go pick up the kids. You don't have to figure out who's going to take out the garbage. You don't have to stress out about paying your bills. You don't have to do the things that you have to do with your spouse on a daily basis. Go through the highs and the lows, the mundane, the ordinary. It's all just fantasy land. It's all just this this kind of uh, manufactured uh, 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 that isn't real. There's no truth to it. And finally, it's a highly ineffective way to find happiness or love. So if you want all these things, go ahead and keep having the affair. But if you're ready for a new life, a better life, a better way, then come home to God. Turn around. Change the way you think because God has a better life for you over on the other side. Now, if you've heard me up to this point and you think, okay, well, this, this is pretty shocking stuff Jesus said. It's pretty challenging stuff. He, he definitely doesn't have the same view that the world has, generally speaking, on these kinds of things. The two will become one, and God made us male and female for this reason. And, and the Bible goes on to say that sex outside of marriage is not of God, no matter what you want to call it. It's not of God. And so God says marriage is for a man and a woman inside the safe boundaries of a a marriage. That said, just in case you're getting a little too comfortable with the, yeah, man, that's what we need to hear. That is the biggest problem the world needs to hear, and the church needs to have the courage to stand up against it. Okay, we do. And now we're going to stand up against your self-righteous judgmental spirit. Because Jesus did. While he doesn't say anything else directly about sex and marriage, there are two stories that really point to how important this is. There's a woman who's caught in the sin of adultery and the religious Pharisees and scribes drag her into this public square where Jesus is sitting. And the Bible says in John chapter 8 that they're trying to trap Jesus. Jesus is playing it super cool. The Bible says he's squatting down like a catcher in a baseball game and he's just... He's just drawing something in the dirt. Man, I wish John 8 told us what he was drawing in the dirt. In my imagination, sometimes I think what he's drawing is what he says later to these same people. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You follow the letter of the law, but you've lost the heart and the spirit of the law in the process. And that's not faithful, and that's not biblical. And it's not what my followers do. You get super loud about behavior... And what's right and what's wrong. And you get super quiet about loving the sinner. About loving the person who steps outside of the boundaries. And that's not not faithful. Because if you're going to follow me, you're going to follow my example. So to this woman who's caught in the sin of adultery, the religious self-righteous, legalistic church or temple leaders say to Jesus... You know that our law says, letter of the law, technically they're right. You know that God's law says that if you catch somebody in the sin of adultery, she should be stoned to death. Never mind, they didn't drag the man out who must have been involved. I mean, I don't know how she committed adultery by herself, but it's just her, which shows their sexism. So we're supposed to stone her to death. And we should let her have it. We've got the stones right here. You want one, Jesus? Because we're trying to trap you. Because you can't, you can't go against God's law. You can't go against the letter of the law. And Jesus, without even missing a beat, simply says this. Let anyone among you who has no sin go ahead and throw the first stone at her. Because he knows they can't. He knows they're hypocrites. He knows they're in the same boat, the sin boat. They're sitting in the same section of the church, the sinner section. They're no better than she is. So one by one, 
You hear the thud of their stones as they walk away. Now please note this. The sequence of events. People say, well, see, that's, that's what... That's what grace-based preachers do too much. They talk about sending away the self-righteous, judgmental religious people, and then they never get to the part where Jesus says to the woman, go and sin no more. Jesus said to the woman, go and sin no more. That's what he said to her. Good, hit that one. Hit that one really hard. Announce it from the mountaintops publicly. In fact, You call out some specific groups of people or call out some specific people and and why does your church, why are you so inclusive and welcoming of all these people? Because what message does that send? It's so confusing for our kids. Oh, I'm so tired of people hiding behind what's confusing for their kids. It's confusing for you because you've lost your way. Jesus comes along and publicly, publicly condemns the self-righteous judgmentalism and dismisses them publicly. And then after they're all gone, he privately, one-on-one, please note this, after they're gone, privately goes to the woman who has committed this sexually sinful behavior and says, where are your accusers now? Doesn't shame her, doesn't humiliate her, protects her, which is what Jesus' followers should do in our world today. Do you do that? Or are you more focused on the letter of the law and you've lost the spirit and the heart of the law? What Jesus is going to say in this story is way more important by his action. She says, my accusers aren't here anymore. Jesus says, well, neither do I accuse you and I'm God. Does that sound like you? When it comes to the L's, the G's, the B's, the T's, the Q's? Do you have love first? Or are you so focused on the behavior and how sinful and how wrong it is that you've lost the heart and the spirit of what it means to follow Jesus, which Jesus clearly is saying in the story is more important because he privately goes to her and says, go and sin no more. But we have to follow that example. Another quick example, there's another woman, a Samaritan woman who comes to a well, Jacob's well, and it's told this story in John chapter 4. And we don't have time to get into the whole story, but she's lost. Spiritually, emotionally, relationally, she's lost. She goes to the well by herself because she doesn't want to run into the townspeople because they gossip about her all the time. And when she gets there, Jesus talks to her, which is pretty scandalous. That a Jewish man would speak to a Samaritan woman is outside the boundaries of their customs. But why does Jesus do that? Because he cares more about her heart than he does about the sinful behavior that she's exhibiting in her daily life. And so he's going to start and lead with love. Which is what his followers should always do. He says to her, along the way in the conversation, go and get your husband. Jesus is God. He knows the situation, that she doesn't have a husband, and she says it. She says, sir, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're correct. Because you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. (laughs) The woman's response, the Samaritan woman's response is just perfect. She goes, sir, I perceive that you must be a prophet. (laughs) Because how could you know this? You just met me. And Jesus says to her, throughout the rest of the conversation, you are included in God's kingdom, you are loved, and you are welcome. Come and follow me. And it completely changes her life. Are you more interested in scolding and condemning the people who are involved in sexually sinful behaviors? Or are you more interested in leading them to the kingdom of God? Because you're not going to get them there and you're not going to lead them there if you don't act like Jesus. What chance do you think Jesus would have had of changing this woman's heart, of either of these women's hearts, if he started with your behavior is completely off? You're you're sexually, you're you're involved in all sorts of sinful behaviors. So as a church, this is the example we seek to follow. And so your issue really isn't with the church and where we stand. It's with the way Jesus does it. We start with pushing away and dismissing the judgmental, self-righteous religious people and saying we're not going to lead with that. We start with love and we start with grace. And then privately, not publicly condemning individuals or groups, we go to that person and we say, let me show you a better way because we love you. Let me point you to God's way. 
instead of the world's way. You say, oh, those are just Bible stories. They, they don't happen in real life. As a pastor of a faithful little country church in rural Huxley right out of seminary called Palestine Lutheran, and some of you were members of that church back then, and you've grown up and now you live in Des Moines and you come here. Great church, great people, salt of the earth. My first or second year there, I went to a high school basketball game at Ballard, the local high school, and people were passing around a, an issue of Playboy magazine. And the reason they were passing it around and there was a lot of gossip was one of the young women who was a member of our church, <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up, was a member of our church posed nude for that issue of Playboy as a student at Iowa State University. They were doing a feature on the girls of the Big Eight at the time. And so now people in the town were passing around this issue of the magazine and everyone's opening it up and looking at this photo of, of this local young woman who was a college student at Iowa State. I'm her pastor. What do I do? Well, she made it easy. She came in and she was crushed, devastated. She said, I made a huge mistake. But she didn't even have to say that if I'm following Jesus for me to offer her love and grace. Not if I follow Jesus' example. So we talked. We talked through the whole thing. What led her to the decision, the pressures that, that pushed her in that way. And, and, and the outcome and, and the shaming and the community and everything that she had to experience. And I was um, moved, inspired by her sincerity. And so we were a month or two away from having a service where the college students were going to come home and they were going to lead the service the Sunday after Christmas. And I asked her, I said, uh, she's very intelligent, very bright. I said, uh, would you please do the children's sermon at that service? <sighs> what do you think the church ladies in that church did to me after she did the children's <laughs> sermon at that service? Which was great because it provided a gentle teaching moment for me to point them to Jesus, for me to point them to a better way, the Christ-like way. She, um, what do you think happens to her heart and to her mind and to her soul if the church she grew up in absolutely shuns her and tells her you don't belong here? Now fast forward to Lutheran Church of Hope today. You know any young people in our church family who you have concerns about their behavior? sexually and what they're doing? What's your heart for them? What's your attitude for them? How welcoming and inclusive will you be of them in this church family? What will you allow them to do? Because I'm here to tell you it's religious tradition that says that unless you're, you know, uh, if you're involved in some sort of uh, sexual sin, that somehow that, you know, puts a black mark on you and you could never repent and you, and you could never uh, uh, find new life in Christ again. And you could certainly never lead a ministry in our church. That's not biblical. Look up King David if you're wondering about that. Read his whole story and please notice God never kicked him off of the leadership throne even in the midst of his sexual sin. We're going to be a Bible church. We're going to take the Bible seriously in this church, which means we're going to let it challenge us, especially when we're getting a little too comfortable with our worldview. See, the problem with a worldview is it isn't often a Christ-like view. It can either get too condemning on one side or it can get way too free on the other. Where anything goes, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Grace isn't cheap. So God calls us to something more, and this is true in our marriages too. How do we get one plus one to equal one? We follow Jesus. There's um, no perfect example of a human marriage. But Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, that's pretty close, and I, I know this personally for a fact because I watched The Crown. <laughs> so let's just assume The Crown is semi-accurate which was very honest about his portrayal of their marriage. They were married 73 years before Prince Philip died, just recently. 73 years. Wow, you got to re-up a lot to be married 73 years. And they didn't all have, you know, smooth sailing. There, there were some issues. The last episode of season two, Elizabeth is concerned that Philip is having an affair 
And she confronts him on it. But I want you to notice what wins the day for them and how their marriage didn't just last, oh, I don't know, 18 years and how they got from 18 to 73. Because with God, all things are possible. And when we know we're loved by God, we can get a clean slate and we can make things pure. If you have a spouse who's had an affair, Jesus doesn't say you have to divorce your spouse. Jesus says you can divorce your spouse because your spouse has broken the vows, the promises that he or she made. But I really believe in my heart that Jesus wants you to at least work on it and to rebuild the trust, to at least give it a go. Then it might be worth it for your sake, not just your spouse's sake. It doesn't always work, and you can go if you want, Jesus says. But sometimes it's better to work on it. Take a look. (laughs) Love is not to be underestimated. I mean, it is a very powerful thing. Who knows if Philip really had an affair or not? The crown is very vague on that, and nobody really knows, except probably Philip. And he's not around to talk about it. The point is, love has the power to heal. When we start with God's love, we get a clean slate, and you're just as pure as anybody. Maybe you carry guilt and shame from your sexual sin in the past. Well, it's time to wipe that slate clean today. Second thing, how to make one plus one equal one in a relationship, in a marriage, follow Jesus, which means, as, we've, as you've heard, it's all about grace and inclusion, but it's also about truth and a high view of marriage. It's both, not one side or the other. Two, or three, keep your vows, be faithful. Four, keep wooing one another. Meet each other's emotional needs in a marriage. If you're going to do that, you need to know what your spouse's emotional needs are. You can't just meet the needs you think she might have or he might have. Talk about it. And finally, choose love. The world gets this wrong. It says, if I feel it, then I'll make the commitment. And the Bible says, make the commitment. And then the feelings will spark. And the feelings are good. (laughs) This last week, my wife and I were um, out of town. And at the end, on our last night of vacation, we went out for dinner. We (laughs) we sat across the table from this woman that I (laughs) am so blessed to be married to. I mean, you know this. Look at her, look at me. Duh. And I'm not saying our marriage is perfect by any means. It's not. We're human. Uh, Silly examples. I have this habit of when it comes to putting my dirty clothes in the hamper, I like to play basketball with my clothes. (laughs) Sometimes I hit and sometimes I miss. Sometimes the hamper's closed and I don't bother to open it. I still shoot. And this, for some reason, I don't understand why, bothers my wife. (laughs) She's not perfect either. I could be watching something very important on TV, you know, sermon research, like the Bears game. (laughs) And she'll um, be on her phone, and all of a sudden I'll be watching the live stream of the game, because we have streaming TV, and it'll do the, you know, the death reel. Like I'm not getting the picture, I'm missing what could be the play of the game. Well, this is tragic. And so, (laughs) invariably I've learned to ask her a question how many apps do you have open on your phone right now (laughs) and her answer is always the same not that many I'll say give me the phone so I'll take the phone and I'll be one two three four five six seventy two seventy three seventy four (laughs) seventy five hundred and eight hundred nine hundred ten and then I open her internet and it's like click 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 like you 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 kind of slow down the game here Yeah, well, you shoot your socks into the hamper and miss. It's not perfect. But I'm sitting across the dinner table from my wife on our last night of vacation this past week. I don't know where it came from. I tell her I love her a lot. But I said, (laughs) and I meant with all my heart, I cannot imagine doing life without you. Not because we're perfect, because the God who brought us together has made two people one. Remember that, those of you who are married. And if you're not, remember that, the people around you you care about who are married. Honor that. Follow God's plan. That the two in a marriage become one.
Amen? All right, I kept you here way too long. My bad. If you want to stay and sing a song, stay and sing a song. If you don't, I'm sorry, band. It's my fault. But stay and sing a song if you'd like.